Good morning. Welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. It's Sunday morning. Sunday morning in December. Hard to believe. December. We're on our way towards Christmas and the Advent. And uh, I pray that all of you have been able to uh, follow along with some of our devotional broadcasts. I've been broadcasting every day in Advent in anticipation of Christmas. And um, yeah, we've had quite uh, a year. 2020 has been a year filled with all kinds of things. But um, we know that God is faithful and God is carrying us in the middle of this uh, pandemic where we're not able to meet together as we regularly would. But I just trust that you would be praying uh, for uh, each other, encouraging one another, connecting with one another where you can. Um, I know that there's a lot of people out there that are discouraged and maybe some that are feeling lonely and afraid. And um, I would just challenge you to reach out to others. And if you know that God has placed someone on your heart, give them a call. Um, speak to them and encourage them where you can. Anyways, I'm just glad that you could all join me for today's uh, Sunday service. So would you, would you bow in prayer as we open our service? Jesus, I thank you for the people that are out there. Thank you, God, that um, you love us so much that you gave your son to come into this world, to die for our sins, and to reconcile us to yourself. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given us life, and you've given us the means to live abundantly in you. Thank you for all the people that are listening. I pray that my heart would uh, be filled with your spirit, Lord, and that I would be able to preach the word that you would have for the people today that would encourage them and strengthen them in their walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I preached uh, a sermon out of 1 Peter. And for those of you who are just joining us, we've been in a series in the book of 1 Peter. And last week I, I spoke on the first uh, number of verses in 1 Peter chapter 3. And my address was to the ladies of the church and uh, as I promised part two it has to do with the men so not that ladies aren't going to uh, find some good meat to chew on through this sermon um, but primarily gentlemen I'll be uh, addressing you today last week we talked about the ladies and how their attitude towards life and how their attitudes towards their husbands has a real effect on the overall functioning of a marriage and the functioning of a family and if there's non-believing spouses uh, the way that we carry ourselves before them and with them uh, might determine uh, whether they will come to Christ or not so these are kind of the things that uh, we talked about last week but now we're going to continue in this uh, book of 1st Peter chapter 3 dealing with family matters and and the focus is now turning to to the Christian men and if you have your Bibles I would ask that you get a Bible because it's important to follow along with this in the word um, please turn with me to first Peter chapter 3 and our text this morning is found in verses 7 and 8 so first Peter chapter 3 7 and 8 husbands in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers finally finally all of you be like-minded be sympathetic love one another be compassionate and humble so in the beginning God created man perfect and without sin God was made, God made Adam in his image the perfect picture of masculinity man without sin was placed in the garden of eden to rule over the creation of the earth and um, man was created to be the ultimate caretaker of everything that god had made and god said that everything that he had made was good god's intention was for man to live in his image and to be a steward of the creation in a spirit of love he created the perfect partner to complement him uh, it wasn't good that Adam would be alone, so he created Eve. God made Eve for Adam so that they would not be alone and that they could become one flesh 
united together, working as a team. And when you think about it, God originally made the man and the woman team to be caretakers together. Uh, what is a caretaker? A caretaker is a steward. A steward is a leader who caretakes uh, what right, rightfully belongs to the true owner. The steward is not the owner. He is not the controller. They are servants of the owner to manage what the owner has given them to manage. Now this ideal, of course, was shattered in the garden, God being the owner of all things, when both man and woman chose to rebel against the Lord their God, and in fact, by definition, um, sin is rebellion against the Word of God. So man and, and woman, according to the Bible, are equals. When they come together, they form a oneness in partnership and approach life together. That's how God intended it. Each, however, in their equality were designed to fulfill different roles in the relationship. Man was designed to lead the family and the woman was designed to complement and complete him in that role. And this is why in the marriage relationship the Lord asked the wife to submit herself to her husband's leadership. And here in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 3, he asked the husbands likewise uh, to submit himself to the role of being considerate to their wives. Uh, needs as the completion. Paul expresses it further in Ephesians chapter 5 1 when he says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in a way of love, in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In the same chapter of Ephesians, we see Paul telling husbands to walk in love, and, and that walking in love really means. Uh, that they should, um, they should be sacrificially giving towards their wives. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 uh, tells husbands, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 5, 28 to 30, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are all members of his body. See, a man was appointed to be the head of the family, but the rest of the body is just as important. God calls men to love their wives in the same way that a person cares for their entire body. You take care of something that you love. Care of Take care of your body and it will stay in better health, right? Take good care of your wife and she will be a better complement to the leadership of the life that your, your Lord has given you to live. And she will be a better helpmate for you. In the case of Adam as leader in his family, he was chosen by God to be a steward of what had been entrusted him to caretake. Right After the fall of man, the correct, uncorrupted leadership that God had intended for him to take on was perverted. The emphasis of leadership was changed inside of the man and tainted by sin. Rather than looking at leadership from the reference point of God entrusting him as leading and being a caretaker and a steward, it was transitioned to being self-focused. And man was uh, tempted to look at himself as having the ownership and control. You see, God called mankind originally to be caretaking and managing. But now, with sin in the picture, humanity wanted to take the place of God, to take ownership and control of things. So when Paul talks about love and husbands loving their wives, he's not simply saying husbands love your wife like you love yourself. If we see it this way, we fail to see the beauty and miracle of marriage. Um, we also mu misunderstand our, our oneness with Jesus. Um, Paul is saying, husbands, love your wife because she is, uh, she is your body. 
You are one flesh. You cannot be separated. You are more connected to your spouse than you are to those who share your DNA. You see, defeating my wife with harsh or insensitive words or harsh physical acts is, sense, is as senseless as standing in front of a mirror and arguing with myself. Now, refusing to nourish my wife by providing for her is, is, is more foolish than not, not feeding myself. In other words, what I'm saying is that God, godly leadership is, is caretaking. Ungodly leadership is controlling. In other words, men, God has not called you to be controllers of the outcomes in your life. God has not made us to be controllers of the outcomes. And he has not made us to be controllers of our wives. But facilitators of the outcomes in life and lovers of our wives. Do you see the difference in this? I believe that getting this concept wrong has absolutely catastrophic consequences on marriage, family, and our society as a whole. We see the brokenness of our society. Out of sin, both men and women want to see themselves on the throne of their own lives so they can control their own destiny without having to submit to God's authority. Therefore, they rebel and they want to have control for themselves. Um, the mind and intellect of the human being is an amazing thing. It's amazing. You know, I mean, it's brought us from, from living in sod houses and log cabins to modern civilization. Uh, it's been responsible for imagining and producing the most powerful of technologies, um, vehicles that operate uh, with engines that are independent of human uh, power, um, aircrafts, spaceships, cures for major diseases, and we could certainly use a cure for this disease coming right now. But, but the mind and intellect of man has also been responsible for some very dangerous things. Wars, genocides, um, cults, the filth of what we see in Hollywood, hydrogen bombs, chemical weapons of mass destruction which could destroy the people and end the earth and its civilization. And the most dangerous of all of these things, the mind has the ability to lead you to believe that there is no God and that you are so smart that you have no need for God or that you are yourself God. In these scenarios, you actually become um, a deity in your mind, which is the height of arrogance and pride if you look at it from the Creator's perspective. The man in rebellion against God longs for control over his own outcomes, longs for control over his own affairs. Man left to his own devices wishes to harness the power of self in the pursuit of wisdom. But what does God say about earthly human wisdom? James talks about it. James 3, 13 to 17 tells us, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. My friends, do you see this? You see, wisdom that comes from the God of this world, the enemy, the false God who raises himself up and... Uh, and calls to men to follow him, okay, the God of this world, Satan, he's filled with selfishness, selfish ambition. God is giving. God is loving. God is not um, filled with selfish ambition like Satan is. Because where there's selfish ambition, you're going to find disorder in every evil practice. Men, when we look at our wives and we think that they are there for our benefit so that we have control over them, so that we can tell them what to do, so that we can be the head of the house, when we have that kind of mad madness in attitude, what do we get? 
we get every evil practice and disorder. The wisdom from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Man of the world, fueled by selfish ambition, long for dominance and power over others, including, uh, including wives. What is this? This selfish ambition. It's unspiritual, and the Bible calls it right here in James, calls it demonic. Have you ever thought of, uh, of Christian men pursuing demonic wisdom because they want the control? It leads to disorder and every sort of evil practice. The saying, I am the man of the house, has such negative connotations. And for good reason, it's essentially a statement which says, I'm in control. I'm the one who calls the shots around here. You must listen to everything I say. This thought process is produced by the wisdom of the world. And it, and it comes from this mindset that power comes strictly from the survival of the fittest. That might makes right. Self becomes king, the mode of survival of the fittest. The weak are naturally dominated for the interests of the strong. Men, are you using your physical strength and your dominance physically to overpower your wife and cause her to fear so that she'll toe the line? If you are, your wisdom that you're acting from is not from God. It is unspiritual and demonic. The doctrine of self-preservation and pursuit of self-interest preached by the so-called wise men of this world in reality crafts a lie and it distorts what true masculinity is to look like. See, men, we're supposed to use our physical strength to protect our families and our wives and to shelter them and to provide for them. You know, this is opposite to what we see in the ungodly thinking of this world. Wisdom that comes from heaven, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. True leadership, authority and power that comes from the wisdom of the Lord is true masculinity. It's not controlling. Rather, it's worn very lightly. And it is for the purpose of service. Christian men are called to be strong and to, and, to, and to use their strength. But strength was never meant to be used to be brutal. Brutality is the devil's business. In a marriage relationship, men, we are called by the Lord to use our physical strength, our convictions, our stability, and, and humble confidence, and leadership to encourage our wives and our children. You're not to use your physical strength to ram your own agenda. God forgive us, ladies, if we do this. This is not from the Lord. I, I, I believe that women want men who can be depended upon regardless of how difficult things get. And, and this isn't the strength like that of a Navy SEAL or a UFC fighter. But the word... Gentlemen comes to mind. You see, ladies long for security and protection, but she wants your strength without feeling endangered. The combination of a man, and I've said this in the past, with the combination of velvet and steel, the conviction of doing what's right and being strong and standing up for what is right like tempered steel, but with a softness and sensitivity and gentleness that comes from a heart changed by God. Christian men, you're not called to be a wimp. You're called to be strong for the ladies and for your families. But be sensitive to the needs that are there. This kind of strength and sensitivity flows from the fountain of God's wisdom. Now, now the media and this world glorifies the wrong kind of man as being the rugged model of masculinity, right? What a lie. 
these icons of masculinity that are presented um, push the ide ideology that uh, the genetic makeup of masculinity uh, tends to be relationally unpredictable and non-committal, in many ways ruggedly independent, brutal, aggressive, power-hungry, hormone-driven, irresponsible and selfish. The iconic man presented in many scenarios has problems keeping his promises, is always sneaky, always cheating, never accountable. The fallen man has become the iconic man. Look at, look at Hollywood. Look at what they portray. A study of Hollywood is actually a fascinating study. It tells you how much our world is generate, degenerating. You know, Hollywood does not recognize that their ideal in character um, actually it comes from the example of of the fallen Adam, the one who was living for himself and who disobeyed God. But I want you to, to see this, that the ideals that are presented out there where a man is unpredictable, rugged, and uncaring, cold, and kind of abusive, that, that needs to be broken. And, and so many ladies have been trained that that's what masculinity is. They've actually grown to be attracted to that. Some ladies gravitate towards abusive men because that's what was, that's what was um, produced uh, in their own backgrounds. So they, they're looking for a man similar maybe to their father. You see, it has this terrible uh, side effect. And it continues in dysfunction from generation to generation to generation, unless that chain is broken. The ideal character of man actually comes from the only man who ever displayed the character of the ideal man, perfected in power, combined with selfless giving of love without corruption. That man is none other than the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true example to follow. The enemy would like to uh, paint the portrait of Jesus as being someone who is weak and kind of anemic. But the, the opposite is true. Jesus was the ideal example of masculine character and strength. This man of God uh, who says, I will follow Jesus and I will exemplify the behavior of Christ, that, my friends, when God gets a hold of that man and he has that attitude and the Spirit empowers him, he is going to be the ideal man to be married to. And I would venture to say that ultimately all ladies would like a man like that, who stood up for what was right, who was strong, but gentle, reasonable, who would treat them as a partner, not as, uh, not as someone to be dominated and, and shoved down. Oddly enough, the devil has twisted the film industry to present the Christian man as this unattractive, deceptive, selfish, two-faced, power-hungry, brutal man who oppresses women for his own gain and puts them in their place as man of the house according to how he de determines they should be put. After all, what? Submit to me, for I am your master. So, you don't like it? Too bad. I'm going to do what I want and you're going to do it with a smile along with me. And if you don't, I'll put you in your place. That's how the world presents the Christian man. Because we live in a culture rooted in Christianity, many disillusioned people have rejected Jesus with the impression that somehow the brutality of the abuse of man that they have encountered in life is somehow the byproduct of what Christianity at worst has taught or at best was powerless to stop. They've been duped by the enemy of the soul into believing that Christianity is the root of oppression. When in fact, Christianity is the opposite of the root of oppression. True Christianity, being Christ-like, is the root of true freedom and true masculinity and true strength. The enemy in the selfishness of sin 
in the sin nature are in fact the root of oppression. Uh, people who are feeling the weight of oppression, of brutality, do not take well to being confronted or controlled and told that they must be submissive to the oppressors. This is why there's so much movement of women's liberation and why it's taken off so strongly. People long for liberation when they're under tyranny, when they're being oppressed. How did this happen? The emphasis of insecure men desiring control, saying, women, you must respect me, brutally pushing their weight both physically and psychologically has done so much damage. Oh, God help us. As a church, to break out of that kind of a mold that has been propagated by the sin nature. I believe that there's been times when men wearing the cowboy hat of Christianity, not sincerely understanding the true nature of faith and devotion to God, have given the true man of God a bad name. A true man of God recognizes that he was created with superior physical strength. Yes. You know, I can bench press three times as much as my wife. But that strength was not given to dominate and control. But it was given to me to be her caretaker, to care for her, to shelter her, to nurture her. The man of God has been called to protect and nurture those whom he has been placed in leadership over. Leadership in God's way, in God's sense, is humble, not proud. Men, if you're domineering, and you're dominating your wife and your family, demanding respect, you're pursuing demonic wisdom. And this is how the kingdom of darkness operates. And as Christians, if we're finding ourselves in this category, we're finding ourselves living this way, there's one word that I have for you today, man of God. Repent. Ask God to forgive you for this grievous sin and cleanse you and soften your heart towards Him and towards others. True men of God realize the rugged, the rugged masculinity that they possess in their physical was given to be humble, supportive, an attitude of servanthood. A man in harmony with God is not belittling, controlling, or demanding. Put another log on the fire. Cook me up some bacon and some beans. Remember that old song? We always we used to laugh at it as kids. But uh, the truth is that men in their sinful natures operate this way. Women are a commodity. Women are something to be used for pleasure and to serve us. Well, that's not how God created mankind and his leadership. That's the fallen man. If a man has to demand that his wife respect him, he has done something wrong a long time ago before this has even become an issue. And this is why Peter says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. So, walk together in unity. Ob observe how you treat one another and repent of any attitude that is askew. God wants you to shine like stars in the universe out there. This world, it's filled with brokenness. It's filled with selfishness. It's filled with darkness. You are the light of the world. You are whole, made whole in Christ. I understand that we still have things to work out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, strive to submit yourself to Christ. This is all part of it. So, would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, I thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that you called us as men and women to be, first of all, servants of you and to submit ourselves unto you and to love you. And out of the relationship that we develop with you, God, change our hearts so that our hearts are filled with humility and we consider the people that we're walking with, in particular our family and our 
spousal relationship, we consider those people above ourselves. That we would serve them, Lord, in the best interests for them. And God, I just pray that you would you just bring strength to the marriages in this church. God, I pray that you would bring healing where there's been sin. And God, I pray that you would bring a spirit of repentance where there is a need to bow the knee of the heart in an area. Lord, you know the hearts of people. You know the struggles we face. You know the insecurities that are there. God, I pray that our security would be in you and that our strength would be in you and not in ourselves. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good Sunday afternoon.